Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes. I want to encourage you to grab something to drink, find a comfortable chair, and let's get into the Word of God tonight. Amen. Hey, listen, it's so good to be with you, and I want to thank you guys for joining us. And as always, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, please hit the like. Um, become friends with us, First Assembly Alexandria. And if you're watching on YouTube, if you could hit the subscribe button, um, that would be a blessing to us. Comment, let us know that you're there. Uh, if you have a testimony, we want to hear it. you got a prayer request, we want to know so we can lift it up. Uh, God is moving. Um, we have been spending some time walking with Daniel through his journey in uh, Babylon, and we keep coming back to the statement, and I say it every week, but God is in control of who is in control. And, and so Daniel was living in Babylon. He's living in Babylon as a light of God, just like you and I are called to this world. You know, we live in a world that does not know the Lord, and you and I are light to it. And I think that it would be great to be able to remember that in the situations of our lives. That as things come and as things happen, and, and there are different situations. There are some that we find ourselves in and kind of go, okay, here's what's going on. You know, did was it my decisions that led me to this point? Were there things in my life that I need to guard more or care more about um, that led me down the road to this path? Or is this something that just kind of God has brought me into, God has placed me in? And uh, I'm a believer that in every situation of our lives, we can learn and grow and become more like Christ in and through it. But all of the moments of my life, in all of the moments of my life, I am the light of who God is to that, that moment. And so when you and your spouse are fighting, you are the light of who God is in that moment. Uh, when you're dealing with a neighbor, when you're dealing with a, a situation at school, when you're dealing with a, a young person or a young person's dealing with another young person, a relational issue or something, you are the light of who God is in that moment. And in that moment, people are going to see who God is by watching you and by watching your life because we are to reflect Him. Uh, they should see us by the way and see God by the way that we, we act and we speak and the way that we love uh, each other. It uh, doesn't mean that you have to stay in unhealthy situations. I've said that before. I say it again. Um, but who you are and how you live your life um, does matter. And I shared with you last week about I'm a believer in spiritual warfare and that there's a God that loves you and there's an enemy that hates you. And, you know, years ago, um, when I say years ago, I'm talking like probably back in the 90s, um, there was a movie called Unusual Suspects and it was such a great movie in its day. And there was a line in that movie that said this, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. And uh, I always thought that was such a classic line. Um, because the thing is this, if you don't realize that you have an enemy, you tend to live more carelessly. Um, if we don't realize, when God says put on the full armor of God, why do I need to do that if there's nothing that I am at war with, if there's nothing that I am battling, uh, and we tend to live carelessly. You know, I, I shared with you, if on a Sunday morning we were sitting in surf, service and I came in and said, hey, listen, the police just came by and there was a lion that escaped from the Washington Zoo and it was spotted on our property and I dismissed everyone to go home, wouldn't you walk from the church to your car a little more carefully? Uh, you would be a lot more cautious. We'd be kind of looking. We'd be kind of taking our time and making sure because there's a lion, a lion that is out there, you know, on the property, and it would affect the way that we lived in that moment. And so I think we'd be more careful. And uh, if you don't believe that there's an enemy, if you don't believe there's someone trying to steal, kill, and destroy from you, you may not fully understand or embrace the reality of we need a savior and we need God to help cover us and defend us and to put on the full armor of God for our lives. Uh, but the truth is, there's an enemy that seeks to do nothing but steal, kill, and destroy. And, uh, and so you and I each day have to put on the full armor of God. Because of that enemy, we are in a battle, and how you live matters, how I live matters, and how we treat each other matters, not just as brothers and sisters in faith, but how we treat the world, how we treat people in the world. Um, you know, we are not called to fight everyone, but rather to love our neighbor as ourself and to, through that, persuade people into Christ. Um, you know, there are people who don't know God that are not your adversary. Uh, they're simply your neighbor. 
Um, and, you know, we do. We, we want to fight people. When there's a problem, when there's an issue, we want to identify who is the person, what is the thing, and we want to go fight that. But rather, we're, we're called to persuade them, to win them uh, to faith. And so, don't be shocked when the world lives like the world. Uh, I know we sometimes are, you know, I, I'm not, I've kind of grown to a place that, that, you know, you see things in the world and you go, it's just crazy. It's unbelievable. And, but don't be shocked when the godless live godless. But I, I think rather we should be more bothered when people who are our, of faith, when people who do walk with Christ, talk like the world, act like the world, live like the world, uh, because we know that we're called to be different. So I think we always have to keep our eyes on Christ and make sure that we are the light of God in the moments that he puts us in. Um, because we can become so casual. Uh, and when you become casual, things slip in. Uh, and when things slip in, they affect our lives. You know, we're called to win people, persuade people not to fight everybody. And Daniel and his friends did this. They did their best for the people that they served. And they followed the advice of Jesus and he simply loved their enemies. Um, and, and I think that would be a great thing because the call on our lives is to go into the world and make disciples and to be a light, to show people the goodness of God in our lives and to teach them and show them how to serve him by living our lives in a way that does that very same thing. It is, it is not about imposing on people. You're going to act like this. You better talk like this. You better respect like this. You, you better handle things this way because you can probably force someone into doing something, but it's not genuine and it doesn't really change a heart and that is what Jesus always focused on. Don't just change their actions, change their heart because if you force someone to change an action, they will do it in context of you. But when you are removed, the people always go back to the heart. You know, Jesus told us never to force people. He said to win them and to be a fisher of men. Uh, you look back at the New Testament when the church was birthed under Roman rule and they were not kind to the church and they persecuted the church and the followers of Christ. And yet in the New Testament, it's all about changing the hearts of people, not changing political parties. You know, changing the hearts because that's what matters. When the heart of man changes, the way he lives and treats his fellow man will change. And so that is why we have to get Jesus and persuade people to know him and to love him. And so people who, who don't know Jesus are not my enemy. They are, they are victims of the enemy. Uh, uh, to be loved and rescued, uh, not attacked. Because scripture is very clear. We do not fight flesh and blood, but evil rulers and principalities of an unseen world. We have to keep that in the forefront of our lives. So our purpose is to go into the world and to be a light so that we can identify, or rather our purpose is not to go into the world and be a light so we can identify all the bad people and then wait for the wrath of God to come and get them, but rather be a light that they might be drawn and that we might love them and show them uh, the love of Jesus. And that means people who think differently than you, people who vote differently than you, people who act differently than you. I am called by God to love them and to show them Christ. I love the way Peter said it. He said, worship God as the Lord of your life and be ready to give an answer at any time. You know, Too often what happens is this. We all go to our corners. Uh, we get our group over here and there's that group over there and that group over there. And we all talk about the woes of the other side and people who don't think or act or speak you know, like us. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of, every time I speak, I try to have like a sermon and a sentence. And this is one of them. If you remember this, I think you'll remember the whole thing tonight. The goal isn't to know who I hate. The goal is to know how to love. Um, may that be the prayer of our lives. May that be the prayer of our hearts and, uh, and of our church. God, I don't want to know who I hate. I, I want to know how you want me to love uh, and go live that. Because the truth is, you know, Jesus was tough on people in the New Testament, but he was tough. He was tough on the religious leaders. He was tough on the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people who had the law and had the word and should have known better, uh, but were way too content to just sit back and judge. You know, Jesus didn't smash sinners. He he didn't tell them it was okay. He didn't tell them it didn't matter. He didn't say, yeah, you can do that and eat that and go there and do those things. He didn't say that. He, he showed them grace. He showed them mercy. He challenged them to go and sin no more. Um, and, and that's what he did. I think we're called to do the very same thing. So Nebuchadnezzar, as we look through the life of Daniel, though, was as bad as they come. 
Um, and yet you cannot show me one place in the book of Daniel where Daniel was rude or ignorant or disrespectful towards him. Uh, you know, every time we treat the lost like enemies, I think we harden their hearts, but I think we also harden ours. And I think we can do better. Um, and so there's this paradigm that we, we touched on last week about that creates a false impression that the success of the wicked means the failure of the righteous. And, and that just simply isn't true. You know, um, there are times, you know, that, but that's why you have a hard time sometimes working, you know, for the boss you're working for. You know, he's not right. They're not right. They, they take credit for things they didn't do. And there's something in us that is angry. You're saying, God, how long will this injustice go? You know, God, how long are you going to allow this to go on before the righteous are redeemed? And, and we sometimes can get caught up into that. But I think God sometimes wants to teach us something that, listen, I can bless you anywhere. Um, if they're doing wrong things and there's success, then I guess righteousness is failing. And what's the point, God? Well, Daniel served in a godless nation and he continued to be elevated the entire time. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's always a failure on our part. And I love the words of Jeremiah. They're just brilliant. He says, this is what the Lord of heaven Armies, the God of Israel says to all the captives he exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem, build homes. That's what he says. Plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Find spouses for them so that you have grandchildren. Multiply. Don't dwindle away. Quit hiding and waiting for all the evil to be removed and, and, and only the righteous remain. He says, listen, bloom where you're planted. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I have sent you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine yours. And, and I love that, that in the midst of any situation, of any culture, God can prosper you under any boss, uh, in any struggle. Really, God can prosper you, so bloom where you are planted. You know, where you are is not an accident. God is in control of who is in control, and God has placed you there. And so you may wonder why. You might say, man, this is a tough situation. This is a hard place, but I am the light, and I represent God to this place in that moment. And so God has placed you there. You know, there are, there are no more loss. The people who are frustrating to you, the people who are uh, seemingly anti-everything you're for, you know, um, they are no more lost than you were before you came to know Christ. Um, and so find hope in that. So who are my neighbors and how do I need to love them um, is one of those questions which just got to keep coming back to. Um, so when we started this journey, I told you that Daniel had three core things that covered him. One was hope. Uh, we've talked about that. One was humility. We spent several weeks on that. And the last one is, is wisdom. Uh, Daniel had wisdom. Uh, in knowing what to do and what God wanted him to do. And scripture tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on Sunday, you know, having the fear of the Lord. There's fear that's bad, there's fear that's good. And so I would encourage you to go back to this past Sunday and, and check out the service and watch that. But the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And, wisdom. and, and one of the ways that this proves itself is the point um, to immature is the lack of perspective. Uh, I think when you see someone who lacks perspective, it is, it is a sign of immaturity. And for some people, for some things, waiting is just not an option. They got to have what they want when they want it. Compromise is always a dirty word. You know, everything is equally important. Well, what do you want? I want it all. Well, when do you want it? I want it now. You know, these are all things. The main thing that matters is the immediate. You know, there's no looking down the road. There's no investing now to be blessed later. It's just, they're just driven. They lack perspective in what they're doing and what they're dealing with. And, uh, and we can sometimes lack the ability to see the bigger uh, picture uh, in areas of our life. And, and uh, you know, I can remember... Uh, when I was, uh, when I, well, I say when I was younger, because my kids were younger, and so that makes me younger. Uh, I can remember trying to trade one of them uh, an, um, a dime for a nickel, and they were like, "No, no, no, no! This one's bigger. It's worth more," you know. And they kind of thought the nickel was worth more because it was bigger than the dime, you know. And it's funny when you're a kid, but it's it's not funny when someone's 25 and thinks like that. When you lack perspective, it's going to impact uh, your life. 
uh, and a new believer, someone who's new in faith, may not have the proper perspective as they're starting this journey because they're still learning some things. Uh, and, and that in some ways can be expected because they just simply need to grow and to mature. But someone who's walked in faith, someone who says, Pastor, I've been in faith. I've walked with Jesus. I know him as my Lord and my Savior. To still lack perspective uh, can be a problem because it directly affects our spiritual maturity. You know, when as a believer, someone chooses the earthly now over the heavenly then. Uh, when we question the goodness of God and God's power uh, because of a problem we're in in the moment. Um, or there's a, a knee-jerk reaction to a sinner, you know, rather than grace and mercy and compassion. And, you know, we can correct in love. You know, there, there's often a sign of spiritual immaturity in those things. And one of the things that sets Daniel apart was that his wisdom and the perspective that came along with it. Daniel just always seemed to choose God's way uh, over the easy way, over the popular way, even if it seemed like it was going to cost him. He never really judged God's power based on Babylon's success. You know, he wanted the best for those that were around him. And even as a young man carried off as a captive, he understood the big picture that God was in control of who was in control. And you could tell by the way he responded to the trials that came his way. You don't really read anywhere in the book of Daniel where he is just having this woe is me attitude and life is so unfair and what did I do? I was doing it right and everybody else was doing it wrong and this isn't right God you don't see him whining and complaining you know the wisdom of Daniel was grounded in a very real healthy fear of the Lord that God's in control and you don't mess with God if God has allowed this there's a purpose and so I want to be the light of God of who God is in this moment and I'm trusting that God's going to work it all out as we move forward uh, Proverbs 9 10 says the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom the knowledge of the Holy One results in good joy judgment. I think having proper perspective and being able to make good decisions based on that. And so that's why Daniel and his friends would always stand with God. They would be obedient even if it was going to cost them because they feared the Lord more than they feared the fiery furnace, more than they feared the lion's den. And Daniel understood something. He understood that not everything is worth fighting for. Um, there's a difference between sin and and things that I find offensive. There's a difference between something God calls sin and something that just gets under your skin. And Daniel, I think, had an ability to not confuse the two. Uh, I think we sometimes struggle with this. I think sometimes there's a lot of people that tend to think, well, if there's something that offends me, it's got to offend God. Uh, we get into arguments and conflicts over things that really aren't worth the fight. They're just not worth the battle. And Daniel understood that there are some things worth taking a stand for and other things, not so much. Not so much. Think about this. Daniel, when he came into Babylon, they changed his name to Belshazzar, which was which was meant Bel's prince, which they basically named him after one of their demonic gods. Now listen, I've been here uh, 18 years. It'll be 19 years this December uh, we've been the pastor of First Assembly. And there still, to this day, are people who call me Pastor West. Uh, there's no T. Can't get my name right. 19 years. You know, Pastor Dustin. A lot of people you know him as, as Pastor Justin. Uh, you know, and it's just, it's, it's fun. See, that's not offensive to me. Daniel was named after a demonic God. I don't think he liked it, but nowhere in Scripture does it say you have to have a good Bible name to go to heaven. It was a hill Daniel simply wasn't willing to die on. It wasn't a lack of courage. It was wisdom, and it wasn't worth the fight. Daniel was taught the occult and witchcraft for three years. He didn't have a choice. It was the core curriculum of their society. It's not a sin to know it. It was a sin to practice it. He understood those things. So Daniel didn't just go to class. And you got to hear me when I say this. He didn't just go to class. He went to the top of the class. And in doing so, it gave him the platform and the credibility to debunk Nebuchadnezzar's trust in all of these things. And actually, later in the story of Daniel, it actually gave him the opportunity to talk to the king about the Most High God. 
Listen, we live in a day. It's a, such a woke day, and and I, you know, I, don't get me don't get me going on all of this stuff. But there's a lot of places and a lot of businesses and a lot of corporations and a changing in the culture culture that require training um, or, or an awareness of things that you may or may not agree with. Well, I think Daniel might might challenge us a little bit because Daniel might encourage you not to try to get out of it or opt out of it, but rather be the top of the class and earn the right to speak. Uh, not taking the class or taking the class is not endorsing it. Taking the class, going through the training is not saying I agree with it. It's, it's saying I want to understand it so I can speak more clearly the things of God to it. Uh, you know, another thing is this, understanding that godless people have godless lives. Um, why are we shocked when the world lives like the world? Uh, I don't see anywhere uh, throughout the book of Daniel that Daniel forced his faith on people. I don't see anywhere where Daniel said, you got to change the way that you talk around me because I'm a Christian. You know, you need to change the way you do things because I'm a Christian and, and that's offensive. And, and I think sometimes you can't legislate holiness. You can't legislate uh, righteousness. Uh, you, can't, you can't make a law for people to be good or else the world would be great because we got tons of laws. Um, I, I think there are ways we sometimes try to force and enforce things and it rather closes the door of influence rather than opens it and and I realize that this is challenging because it hits us all on a lot of different levels you know what I fail to speak do, to am I condoning it uh, you know what does that mean in the context of me being a parent and the raising of kids what does that mean in the context of me being a person of faith uh, and loving my neighbors do I just say sins okay well no sins never okay uh, but I have to realize that if they aren't in faith they're in the world and the world's gonna live like the world um, and, and what we need, though, is wisdom in our day to be in the world, not of it. Uh, to live your life, my life, in a way that allows our light to shine so that people can see Jesus in us. Uh, Daniel put up with a lot in his day. Things that they said about him, things that they did to him, things that they tried to do to him. Um, and, you know, the word, when you think of putting up with things, Daniel was tolerant. And that's a, that's a hot button word, you know. Tolerance used to mean this. Tolerance used to mean giving people the right to be wrong. Giving people the right to be wrong. And today it doesn't really mean that. Today I think the word tolerance has kind of been hijacked and it's been redefined because it doesn't mean giving someone the right to be wrong. It means now that no one is wrong. Uh, you have to be tolerant. I can say, well, I could marry a tree if I want to. You can't say anything about it. Whatever anyone wants to do with their lives, it is okay. And God forbid, God forbid, if you dare tell anyone that that's not right and you shouldn't do those things because you're now intolerant and you're a bigot and you're all of these things and you're, you are now in the group that no one is tolerant of. And it, it's ironic how it works like that. But the world is going to live like the world. Um, and it's not going to change by me hating it. It will change by me loving God with my heart, soul, and mind, and my neighbor as myself. And I think Daniel can really teach us something if we're willing to learn how to love and how to live in a godless society as a person who follows God. He understood the world's going to live like the world and that people of faith should live like the people of faith in a way that our light is seen. And when the time is right and the moment is there, we step forward and we speak in love. But wisdom says, pick your battles. And I think it was one of the key things in the life of Daniel. He was resolute in his refusal to sin. I will not sin. I will not dishonor my God, but he also understood that there were things that he maybe not didn't like that weren't necessarily sin. And Daniel decided, I'm going to draw the line where God draws the line, uh, not where I want it to be. And he loved the Lord with his heart, soul, and mind, and his neighbor as himself. And so maybe this week, we need to pray differently about some situations in our life. Maybe this week, instead of praying for someone, God, make them change, make them stop, make them go, make them, you know, whatever. maybe we need to pray, God, grant me wisdom to know how to love in this situation. Grant me wisdom, God, and to know what to tolerate, what to tolerate, and what to say, no, no, this is dishonoring of God, I, I can't. Um, and grant us wisdom on how to move and navigate uh, those things that people might see God in us. Because if you read the book of Daniel, 
it worked out well, man, it worked out well. Couple things before I go. Uh, one, backpacks, we are so close. We're like two or $300 away from having it all done and it has been trickling in and I just thank you guys. I thank you guys for giving. Backpacks have been delivered, kids have them. Everything is going great there. If you wanna help us finish up that process, it'd be beautiful. Uh, there'll be a link down below you can give. Uh, secondly, is Flip Flop Sunday on September 5th. Not this coming Sunday, but next, uh, we're gonna have a picnic. Just come dress down, relax. We're gonna have a great time. We got Missions Barbecue coming. We we got food trucks coming. Uh, we're just going to have some great fellowship. Going to be a baptism that morning and service. We've got a couple of folks signed up already. If you've never been baptized and are interested in being baptized, contact the office and uh, we'll get you all hooked up. And we look forward to doing that. But I'm super excited about that. And uh, I just want to encourage you guys. You man, let's love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourself and be the light where God has you. I love you, First Assembly. I pray you guys have a great week, and make sure you tell somebody about Jesus.